you very much. Item 14. Local Board Reorganisation Plan Public Consultation. The Working Party recommendations and the resolutions of the Local Boards are different and some people have complained that the Working Party came to a different conclusion that their Board resolved to have. But I've said to the Northern Boards, that's why you have a Working Party. To consider things in more detail and come up with a way forward, which is what they've done. <coughs> the staff advice is also to put a 13 Local Board model to the public, which is closest to the Royal Commission model and lets the public have the widest range of, op of options. We're just discussing today whether to let the public have a say, and local boards will have a chance to have a proper look at things and a say then, another say then. Nine or so local boards said they want to consult on it, even without necessarily liking the idea. Well, welcome Rose and team, and I'd invite Councillor Ferry to speak to us about the Working Party. I attended quite a few of them, and they got into re real detail and I understand we also have the Deputy Chair of the Working Party, Kath Handley, online somewhere out there. Welcome, <coughs> Kath. Councillor Ferry, would you like to say anything before this gets too far down the track? Uh, hmm. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to necessarily speak before the staff, so I thought maybe if, if it's OK I'll, with you, I'll, I'll let the staff let you... go first. Yeah. That's cool. Right out. But this is about a recommendation to ask the public and we have asked and heard from the boards in the mixed bag, but I think we should be democratic and ask the public what they think. Rose. Kia ora, councillors. Um, thank you for your time today. I've got Libby Hitet with me, who's been managing the project with, with us and um, a team of people behind me, because this has been a cross-council working group alongside the Joint Governance Working Party. So if you are going to ask some really technical questions, we're ready. Um, this is the first of three papers on today's agenda about how Aucklanders are represented in Tāmaki Makaurau in the near future. This paper is on the potential reorganisation of 21 local boards. The next paper, Warwick's going to pick up with you, is on the number of wards and ward councillors and how they are elected and some boundary changes. And then after a paper from my colleague Christy, there'll be a third paper relating to the new bill on Māori seats, which is before Parliament at the moment and I believe is partly why the hikawai is our site. Um, but before I begin on content, um, just to remind you that the genesis of this work was the Mayor's proposal midway through last year to have fewer local boards that were more fairly funded and more empowered. The governing body then delegated this work to the Joint Governance Working Party to develop options. The work um, we're taking you through and that Joint Governance Working Party has been um, beaming away on to date, um, thank you Councillor Julie Ferry and Kath Hanley, has taken eight months thus far. Um, and the analysis we have undertaken and the options and the recommendation to consult with Aucklanders is the first one that we're looking at today. But once you've decided on the scope of the consultation you wish to undertake at today's meeting. We'll be coming back to GB next month on the 27th of September, oh, sorry, the 27th of June, getting ahead of myself, um, with consultation material, um, and you can sign that off um, before you make a decision finally in September, and then we convey your decision to uh, the Local Government Commission, who are the final decision makers. This is in time for the 2025 elections. Councillors, you're going to be making some decisions today um, through this work that relate to how local, local boards are elected. When making these decisions, you should put aside your views on how this might affect the outcome of upcoming elections. Instead, the thought uppermost in your mind should be the considerations you give to how representation arrangements will serve local communities and how this will impact on the way we serve them together. Joint Governance Working Party's recommendations um, uh, I'll just start at the top there, though you can read them for yourself, but I'll summarise, um, is that, um, firstly, that we must consult on the representation review in any event this year. That's because we have to do that every six years. So what we're asking you to consider is to look at um, adding consulting on the number of boards into the consultation that we must undertake. 
Secondly, that we ask Aucklanders if we should stay with 21 local boards or change to 15 local boards, largely by amalgamating existing ones. Um, and finally, when it comes to making decisions to submit to the Local Government Commission in September, that if you think that there are some things that have not been resolved, then we could consider taking more time and progressing towards 2028. And as you know, um, staff are also recommending that you consider going out to consult on 13, as the Mayor has said. Thanks, Libby. Um, so just looking at what the journey that we've been on with the Joint Governance Working Party and, and the direction of travel is just looking at that we map that we've put together. These are all of the things that we have been considering. We've done a value for money assessment, which is in your attachments. We've undertaken some early engagement feedback, primarily to understand if well, what, what the issues were that some of our stakeholders and Māori um, thought about this proposal, and to just bring general awareness so that people could be ready. Um, we took direction from the Joint Governance Working Party, who are very knowledgeable about their communities, and um, gave us some really um, helpful advice about uh, boundaries, etc., and gave us direction and steered the ship. We also looked at the long-term plan um, and the objectives and challenges set out therein. Um, we have been working on with our colleagues in local board services on the more empowered local boards work stream, which I'll touch on briefly today. We looked at elected member surveys um, from quite a few years, so the last three in particular, to see how things were tracking, how elected members were feeling about the support and the advice that they received. And then we also um, went back and had a look at the Royal Commission findings, and all of that is set out um, in your report. The legislative provisions that you must guide you when making this decision are set out in paragraph 20 and 42. I'm sorry, there's actually a mistake in the report. It says 18 and 40. It's 20 and 42. So all of our analysis has centred on the tests that are provided for in legislation um, that help guide us. So um, we've, we've done quite a bit of work, suffice to say. Thanks, Libby. I did want to go... Um, quite a bit into detail really on the value for money assessment because this is where we really looked at testing the local 15 local board model and the 13 local board model against the status quo. The value for money um, work looked at three spheres which are covered in the legislative provisions that is effective engagement of communities, effective decision making for communities and economy and efficiency. Through that work, we identified, and I just have to caveat by saying this: this is um, these are estimated savings um, to that that would accrue to these models. A benefits um, of 6.9 million dollars per annum under a 15 local board model, and 9.2 under a 13 local board model. These are sustainable annual savings over the long term that could be put to different use. Together with the more empowered local boards work um, that we're also undertaking, larger boards um, in, the, in the value for money review were identified to have, um, we would be able to give them better organisational service, a stronger voice for their local communities when speaking with or engaging with the governing body on the impact of regional policy and decisions at the local level, a bigger pool of opportunities to make decisions on, but still at the local scale, and more effective and efficient asset network planning, again, still at the local scale. But as with all proposals for change, there are downsides. There's a risk that local boards are not as close to their communities, a risk that there is more travel time for constituent work, and that if boards are larger, some unique community issues might not be resourced or understood. So at the direction of the Joint Governance Working Party, we, we undertook some early engagement with Māori, advisory panels, council group staff and others. Um, and as I mentioned, there were mixed views, which you can read for yourself there, but essentially some in the community and stakeholder forum um, were more in favour. There was positive feedback on a reduction focused on reducing cost um, and the complex structure and the pot potential for less competing interest. There was negative feedback on a reduction where it felt that smaller boards had greater understanding of local issues and could therefore respond better to local needs. 
and there were suggestions to reduce the number of boards for further than we had been looking at, which at that point was 15 local boards, which is why staff have included 13 local boards. It's primarily for that reason. <coughs> Importantly, in this decision, you must take into consideration the views of local boards. The majority of local boards who provided feedback at this early stage do not support change. However, nine out of the 21 agreed with going out to consultation, including those, some of those who opposed change. Um, a few of the other things that I mentioned we looked at. The long-term plan, um, as you know, you just finished all that work, um, sets out objectives that council is seeking to achieve, and one of those is the need to be efficient and effective. Savings need to be found in the organisation so that we can deliver better for communities. A proposal for fewer local boards is likely to contribute to those goals, not just for efficiency's sake, but effectiveness. I'm not saying that the savings um, for associated with fewer local boards must be realised. The idea is that those savings could be put to enhanced services for our communities. Additional funding, as you know, has been set aside in the LTP in two ways. There's the fairer funding work, which has meant that um, achieving equitable funding for local boards in, the, in that process, that no local board would be worse off. There's also funding, as I understand it, to deliver local services differently, recognising that we need to change the way we deliver local services that is not so reliant on owning and maintaining all assets. The Joint Governance Working Party has also been looking at the how the organisation can empower local boards to carry out the functions that they already have. What this initial work has shown is that local boards want the culture of the organisation changed towards delivering more effective local services. It's not just about projects and the budgets that we fund them with, but it's about how we work. <laughs> Staff want to embrace this, but note that it is difficult to achieve this with 21 local boards to, it, to serve. And just two final pieces of our analysis. The latest elected member survey shows reduced satisfaction with the advice and support that elected members receive, and this is especially true amongst local board members. Finally, it's important to note that this is the first time we have looked at the number of local boards in Auckland since 2009 and the work that was done on the Royal Commission ahead of Auckland Council being established. The Commission looked at three models for the number of boards. It looked at 20, 11 and 6. They dismissed the local board model, uh, 20 local board model with literally no analysis, citing that the transactional load would be too high. They did some analysis on 11 local boards and six local boards, or local councils as they called them, and as many of you will know, they landed on six local councils. 14 years on, the feedback from staff who deliver local services is that although they see many benefits to 21 local boards, it is difficult to serve 21 and to meet everyone's expectations. So, on to the options in front of you. The status quo, you know well, no need to dwell on that. 15 local boards in which there would be a change for 12 current local boards and nine would be unaffected. And a 13 local mo mod board model, if you were to consider it, in which 16 local boards would be affected and five unaffected. And I know the maps are small. I'm hoping you can read them online and if you've got printed documents on those. But just a brief overview of the 15 local board model. How was this arrived at is the question that we get most often. But quite simply, it's an amalgamation of boards where there are two boards within a ward. This is a simple and easily defensible model because it utilises existing and agreed on communities of interest. Communities of interest is something that we must consider in this work. And I just wanted to point out that the population within amalgamated boards um, is up over the 190,000 mark for um, hibiscus and bays and upper harbour. If they were to be combined right down to 1,000 for Aotea Great Barrier, that is because we are not required in the Act to make all local boards the same size, but if we're going to split them up for electoral purposes, those um, electoral subdivisions must divide the populations equally so that with, on, within any local board 
then there is an equal amount of representation per electors. Um, I think a really important comparator to consider up here at this point is that Hamilton City Council is 180,000 um, population. 13 local boards. Um, we're not as advanced in our thinking on this, but we could be by next month, should you choose it. We have two options we would like you to consider, the first of which is one that you see on the screen. Um, it combines two communities of interest in the isthmus, that of Albert Eden and Waitamata. Um, we looked at this early on, um, and the conversation arose out of a the conversation arose at the Joint Governance Working Party, which is why we did a little bit of work of it on it. On balance, though, this is not the option that staff recommend, as it combines Maunga Kiki Tamaki with Orake, which are harder to consider as a single community of interest. Okay, so the reorganisation um, 13 local board option 2B uh, has the advantage of not combining Maunga Kia Ke Tamaki with Orake and is closer to the work that the Royal Commission model at arrived, arrived at for 11 local boards. And as you know, those of you who were around at that time, there was an awful lot of research that went into that work. I'm not saying things haven't changed, they have, but it's a model for you to consider. So I just bring to the what you're about today. Um, we're hoping that you will want to hear from the public um, because that's a requirement um, if you're going to be making any changes um, on how they are to be represented at a local level. Uh, this will be the first time, as I said, Aucklanders will get a chance to have a say about how they would like to be represented locally since 2009. We believe there's sufficient rationale for you to consider consulting and giving the public two options for change, a 13 local board model and a 15 local model board model alongside the status quo. But of course, that's our advice and you get to make the decision on that. Um, just to recap, final slide on what happens next. Depending on what you decide today, we will go away and prepare material for consultation on local board reorganisation or not. But in any event, we will be preparing material for the representation review that you must consult on and undertake this year ahead of the 2025 elections. And you will see that material back with you, the consultation material um, in 20, on the 27th of June. Um, we'll go out and consult in July, August, and then you'll see the decision finally in September. And that is it from me. Happy to take any questions. Okay, well, Councillor Foley's rushed into the gap, followed by Councillor Newman, and if you'd like to say something next, Councillor Ferry, you can speak now, actually. Councillor yeah. Ferry can have first crack of the whip, and thank you for the chairing those interminable meetings which we sat through. Uh, kia ora. Um, so I just wanted to make some comments as the chair of the Working Party, and then I'm going to take my chair hat off, and I'll just be a common garden member around the table, if that's okay. Um, the first is to just comment on... Um, the resolutions, the recommendations from the Joint Governance Working Party and how close the votes were actually on producing those, which I don't feel comes across in the report. So um, we actually had an amendment um, initially to only go to a minor reorganisation proposal, so not changing the total number of local boards at all, uh, and that only lost by five votes to seven um, on... So just so people are aware, that was a close one. Uh, there was another close one um, for uh, what we do have there, which was um, six votes to five with an abstention. Uh, and um, also uh, there was a close vote on whether we're aiming for 2025 or 2028 mm. um, as well, which was, sorry, I need new glasses. Uh, seven votes to five. So I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of that broader context, that actually the working party was quite split on a lot of this. Um, and those lines fell in strange and unusual ways. Sometimes, didn't they, Councillor Newman? Um, not, not, and, 
<laughs> and it wasn't necessarily all the local board reps voted in one direction and all the governing body reps voted in another direction at all. It was quite a mix. So I think it's really important that people approach these joint governance working party recommendations with that context. Um, that, uh, and, and I guess I would encourage my working party members, um, I am taking my working party chair hat off as I consider these, uh, and sitting here as a ward councillor, um, once I've finished making this comment, and uh, I would encourage the other working party members to, to take a similar approach. Um, given the closeness of the votes, I don't feel, uh, I won't feel slighted if people vote other ways or, or whatever vote, way they vote on this given that. And noting that we continue to have a number of other processes um, that we are working on. So there'll be no ill will or um, anything at the table if, if people vote in <coughs> different ways. There wouldn't be any way, but just to make that clear. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the 213 options, um, they were not part of the conversation we had when we, wrote, when we did those resolutions on the 12th. Um, we did discuss 13 at earlier points. Um, people may remember we turned it down for early engagement at this group. Um, it nonetheless was discussed through early engagement as part of looking at other options more broadly. Um, but those two uh, options, 2A and 2B, didn't come to the working party for our consideration for the resolutions. That concerns me, to be honest. Um, but here they are, and uh, obviously it's our decision today as to what goes out to consultation with the community. Uh, and I'll leave it there and, and step back as the Chair of the Working Party and sit here as a Ward Councillor. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Councillor, and for, thank you for the work you did there. I sat through quite a lot of those, and you're right, they were close. Close, I believe, means we need to ask the public, in my view, but we'll ask Councillor Fully instead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, team, for all of your work, and thank you also to Councillor Ferry and um, Chair Handley for leading that joint governance working party. Uh, my question has kind of been answered by Councillor Ferry in her um, submission. I was going to ask about those 13 options to A and to B, how much discussion was had at the governance joint working party, because, I mean, obviously we task that party to have a much closer um, and more robust conversation, including the local boards, about all of this, the reorganisation. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm mindful to accept that recommendation from them, um, but seeing this come up, I was really wanting to understand how much then, how robust a discussion has been had about those two options, 2A and 2B. My second question is around, because you've talked a bit about why staff have included it, talked a lot about efficiencies and cost savings, um, and I, I accept that that's in Clause 9C um, of the, um, you know, mandatory considerations we have to have as council. But can you make, help me to understand how that fits in with the other clauses? Because under Clause 9, we have to find a way to take account and best achieve all of the following. And it's A to I. I also need new glasses. <laughs> um, and I can't see how... 2A or 2B, especially 2A, um, a lot helps us to align local board areas of communities of interest. Um, I can't see how it, like in D, assurances that local boards would be resourced to enable them to meet their responsibilities when you're creating, when the proposal creates mega local boards, many of them bigger than Hamilton, many of them bigger than most cities around this country. We don't resource our local boards now to service 90,000 90, people, 80,000 people. How will we resource them to service 180,000 people, you know? So if you can help me to understand why it is that staff have made that recommendation and how much weight you've given to efficiencies and cost savings versus all of these other things we have to consider, including communities of interest, including our ability to, or local board's abilities to serve much, much bigger areas. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor Foley, and thank you for your question. It's a good one. Um, the value for money analysis did look at costs, but it also looked at, as I said, those three spheres, which encompass a lot of those other Clause 9 objectives. So those were, I'll just refer to my notes, um, I think we had them as, uh, we, we rounded them up and looked at them as, I'm just looking for my notes, here we are. The three spheres um, that are covered in many of those Clause 9 objectives are effective engagement, 
effective decision making and economy and efficiency. So that's what we're trying to balance here, and you're quite right, that we need to, how best to achieve all of those things, which is why I haven't really overplayed the cost savings. And the idea is, because your second part of your question was about how can, how can we um, serve or best serve uh, very large local boards. What we've found through the um, more empowered work is that what local boards are looking for is better staff support and better advice and more timely advice, that they're not getting it as quickly as they would like. And the organisation's quite stretched to do that. So the idea is that we don't make those savings, like we don't bank them, we don't realise them, but rather we plough the savings that we make from having fewer back into better, more timely and more effective advice. So that's why I haven't sort of said you've got $9 million extra to play with or seven million, nearly $7 million to extra to play with. The idea is to reinvest that money back into, back into the... Um, the advice and support so that local boards can actually make the decisions that they've already been given um, to make, which they don't feel that they have. Um, to your first question, though, why did we, or how did we include it, and how much, um, how much consideration was it was given? It wasn't given much, which is why we're asking you today to consider too, because it's not as well developed. Um, we did some initial work, there was some thinking that one of the really big sticking points was what to do with the faux local board, how to divide it. It was really early stages. So I'm not hiding from that, but again, the reason why I put it in was because there is an ability to consult with the public now and see what they think, but also because there was quite a bit of feedback. Not heaps and heaps, it wasn't the overwhelming, but it was just that, that we hadn't gone far enough and that we should be looking for... Um, well, some people even said we should have started with a blank sheet of paper, which I disagree with because that would have been too hard um, and we didn't have the time. But I think that we've made, with this model, a decent attempt to really look at the demographics in those communities, to try and join up communities that we know have some similarities with each other um, and, and to look at the numbers, which we must. Um, when we're actually sort of trying to figure out how we're going to be looking at wards as well. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor Newman, please. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you to the officers. Um, I was also on the working party, and I voted for the recommendation for a consultation and for the consultation with respect to giving effect for 2025. And I will be voting for that today. I'm not sure if it will pass, to be honest, but I do so on the basis of letting the public have their say. Um, I won't be voting for B, but what I wanted to, what I wanted to ask you, and it sort of goes to what Councillor Fully has inquired. I actually wonder if your report overplays the value for money assessment. Ultimately, this is about representation not organisational efficiency. If there is an organisational efficiency requirement, would you agree that that could, could be achieved through wider organisational efficiencies that go beyond the representation arrangements? For example, it doesn't necessarily matter if there are 21 or 30 or 40 local boards. If the organisation has to respond to the decision to have that quantum of local boards, the organisation will just have to find operational efficiencies to provide that service offering to those boards. Would that not be a reasonable assessment? That's the first question. I'll, you might, <clears throat> you I, might, go. I might take that one, Councillor. I, I, um, I can't say I think that is a reasonable proposition. What you would be asking effectively me to do is um, you know f um, deal with any m additional marginal costs um, and find them on top of all of the savings challenges you've already given me. So ultimately, if you have to make an assessment as to what we're trying to do here, the first thing would be to ensure the representation arrangements for localism, because that's what the local boards are there to do. Yes, and therefore 
that would be the first priority. The second priority would have to be ensure that the organisation can somehow support that, not the other way around. Is that correct? Through the Chair, the Act actually asks you to balance all of those considerations. It doesn't give one or the other primacy. OK, so we have to balance that out. The, I think the Joint Governance Working Party attempted to do that, and it didn't recommend 13. But 13 is... Uh, uh, the consultation is... Uh, it consultated the recommendation here includes, um, based on the staff advice, admittedly, 13 being included. But that specifically was discussed but excluded by the Joint Governance Working Party, yes? Yes, and I'm not hiding for that. I've, I've highlighted it in the report. Yeah, OK. So, I mean, look, reserve my right to speak, Chair, but I, I just think that it is very important to recognise the distinction between the debate around 21 versus 15 and the 13, because 13 was specifically excluded, but it is recommended for inclusion here. Thank you. Councillor Henderson, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have many. Um, just looking at the uh, proposal here, it says in the positives that boards are being more empowered by the proposal. How would they be more empowered? The proposition is to um, plough the savings back into staff advice and support. That's why we're not saying that the savings can be realised. So what we've heard from local boards is they're not happy with the service that they're getting from the organisation and they feel as if they aren't getting great advice or support. Um, that, that, that feedback's actually been increasing, especially with local boards in the last three engagement surveys that we've had with them. So the idea is that they need better support and advice to, be, to actually carry out the activities that they already have in their allocation table. Just, just so I've got that clear, are local boards giving feedback that there's a lack of staff or staffing for them? No, but if you follow the logic, advice and support comes from staff. So they're saying that they've not got enough staff and they've not got enough support. OK, got a, got a couple more. Thanks, Mia. Um, look, one of the risks in the slide, disbenefits, is a, a, a risk that board members are further away from their community. Could mm. I just ask you to expand upon that risk, please? Sure. The, the idea that if a board is larger, although I will note that the proposition includes that if we do amalgamate local boards, that we up the number of members on local board to ensure that representation is not decreased, because that was something that the public also, or the feedback that we got from the advisory panels, that they were concerned that there would be a large scale loss of representation. So if you take my meaning, if you, go, if you take um, two local boards, amalgamate them together, we would, um, there still would be a small loss. Um, so two local boards that are currently seven each would amalgamate and become a board of 12 because that's the maximum number you can have under the Act. But those would be within subdivisions which would be equal. So um, to get back to your point, um, I think it's that there is a risk, and I've put it up as a risk, that having a bigger board, that those local or more local issues might get lost in, in the scale of the decisions that would be made. So just to be... Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so just to be clear, so with either of the proposals, either 15 or 13, people would have less representation per head of population in those boards, where you've got seven, seven going into 12? Yes, at around about, uh, around about the scale of 8% less. So we'd go down from 149 members, I think, to 137 um, under the 15 local board model. So just under 8%, yeah. you'd go down from 149 to, I think it's 135 um, under a 13 local board model. Thank you. Um, got a couple more. Um, my last two are around the local board feedback. Um, so you've noted here the majority do not support change. How many boards actually supported change? Um, Actually, just checking this 
Sorry, do you have off the top of your hand, I'm sorry if this is already here somewhere, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure it's staring at me in the face, uh, which nine local boards agreed to go up to consultation? Um, we're just working on that for you. I have appended. So nine out of the 21. Yeah. I just can't remember off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, that's, that's okay. Thank you, Mayor. We can come back to you. Yeah. Okay. Just to remind you, we are actually debating whether we're asking the public about this. Ken, Councillor Turner. Thank you. So, um, I wasn't on the committee, the working group, um, and I did, but I did speak to you in the Councillor drop-in session, etc. My question is about the scope I'm worried because we've already had our scope restricted by this. And what I spoke to you about, and and didn't, you know, I took it for granted that that we were trying to get equity. You know, we we talk about all these words like diversity, inclusion. Then we talk about our communities of interest. If we're trying to get it even for everybody, surely we start with equally sized boards. And so I look. I, I'm so shocked to see that we have, you know, we, we've we got the Waitakere uh, Rangers local board, third smallest by population, fourth, uh, sorry, third biggest by area, fourth smallest by population. We're combining that with Henderson Massey, yet we leave foe behind. We've got the ability there to make two wards of an equal size, and therefore it's much easier to apply a rationale to it to make everyone get the same funding, the same outcomes. Um, so we have a board there that's 190,000 people, right beside one of 83,000 people. Um, it seems to be to me like it's a fundamental problem with trying to get an even representation, an even outcome, equity, and and uh, you know uh, be able to spread our our funding and our and our support equally. Would that? It's a good question and I'm happy to answer it. If you take the decision-making body that is governing body, the numbers that you represent must be even between each of you. If you take a, a decision-making body like a local board, the numbers that, that, that each of those members represent in terms of electors must be even or close to even within 10%. So it's within the decision-making body itself that the equity must be achieved. But there are lots of different reasons to have different sized local boards. We already have them. The size of the number of members can vary between five and the top number is 12. Excuse so me. that is the logic that is in the Act. It's not something we have dreamed up ourselves. And just another question on the funding. Like I just took it for granted that I didn't realise the, the savings was going to be made out of the staff activity, I saw that as rats and mice. I thought the savings was going to be made out of better productivity and better performance and of the whole thing sort of thing. So this will still leave us, even though you might have uh, members representing the, even, the, the same number of people, you'll end up with a board, like in, Henderson, in Henderson Massey's case, which is the, the second most um, um, funded board, and then Waitakere's case, which is one of the poorest funded boards, just because of the way we apply that calculation of 95-5. That's my point, you know, we've got 90% area, 5% deprivation, 5% population. Um, surely making the boards, we don't have to be equal, but, but it's not saying we, we, we can't make them equal in, in all parameters, is that not right? Through the Chair, we have to um, also balance out the communities of interest um, provision. So where possible, we try and keep communities that relate to each other together. It's not just a numbers game. This is, this is difficult stuff. We have to achieve a balance of those objectives. So thank you. Last thing. So if you put that map back up, um, just I'd, I'd make the point that um, in the Waitaki Ranges, and of course it's West Auckland, so, so it's where I live and where I know, and I, I, you know, I'm not sure of how this applies to other places. But if you look at number four, the people on the north side of that harbour, their community of interest basically is goes into New Lynn because that's where they travel, that's where they view, that's where they shop. You go to the, to the um, northern side of the ward, it's of the local ward area itself, 
and they all focus on Henderson. So the communities of interest don't, as one big group, they might be the same, but you can easily split that on communities of, of, of interest as well. You're right, you could split it and you would have more local boards. You'd have the same number of boards in that instance. Not if you absorb not, the flow, not, but not they're going the back to what the working group about. spoke about. I understand. Yeah. Um, so the point here is that my fundamental questioning of this will be locked out if we take this to consultation <coughs> because the scope is there, right? I hesitate to say this, but if you are considering a 13 local board model and there are changes to the two that you see there, then you might want to kick this back to the Joint Governance Working Party to consider. Everyone's got a say on this one here, but I can remind you, we're just asking, not to explain it to you people, we're asking, can we ask the public? Councillor, Deputy Mayor Simpson. Thanks, Mayor. I've got a real open mind on this, but uh, I think what we are uh, doing here is big for Auckland and big for our local community. So I am um, in fan, a fan of consulting with Aucklanders. But my question to you is, we have to make this really easy for Aucklanders to understand the advantages and disadvantages of status quo 1513 for them to make informed feedback. So I, my question to you is, how do we uh, input into that. Will we have a workshop? You're not going to draft something up and just bring it back here for final. T this is really big. This is about. This is about asking Aucklanders, you know, who they want to <coughs> represent them to their, you know, around their local town centres, their local parks. They have to understand the w what's being. If we go to consultation, and I'm just. But, I, mean, I wasn't on the working party, right? But I'm all for asking Aucklanders what they think because Auckland Council has so much to do. I mean, every every you wake up in the morning and everything you do is Auckland Council, pretty much, right? So I, I want to know that I've got a really good lens of if we say yes, we're going out to ask Aucklanders. I want to have a really good lens on what that document looks like. This is almost as big as the LTP. It is very important, I believe. So how do I do that, Rose? What, uh, how much time and what opportunity are you going to have, give me to make sure I feel comfortable with a doc? I mean, Auckland Council is so complicated to Aucklanders now. We've been gone, ha going how long? And they still don't know the difference sometimes between who does what. So what's that going to look like? What input do I have into that? And because it's pretty quick, isn't it? If we do it, how long we do, and how long do we have? <laughs> We're going to bring back consultation material. I'm very happy to do, by the way, a workshop with you um, uh, in next month. You are dead right. This is complicated stuff. Um, I've every confidence in staff that we can make this simple because we made the LTP simple. We got a lot of submissions. I'm confident we can do that. In fact, the team have already been working on the you know, the shell of it um, and in readiness for whatever decision that you make today so that we can turn that round really well. It also has some of the things that we're um, planning uh, in order to make it simple and understandable are things like explainer videos because it's true, Auckland Council's, uh, sorry, Aucklanders do not understand what governing body does versus local boards. So I'll be making good use of those explainer videos in the lead up to the election too, because this is what this is all about, is how they're represented and how and what local boards do and how and what governing body members do. The team, of, I've already had a quick look at what those explainer videos are going to look like and they look great and they will be simple. So will you get everybody submitting on this? I don't know, but we are very capable of making um, quite complex material, simple. I'm very happy to share our initial work with you. Um, I think um, I can arrange um, for something in a couple of weeks' time. Reserved my right to speak, Your Worship, but um, yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. Councillor Walker, please. So, 
I've got a few questions, um, and they're to do with the so-called local board and what a member of the community would expect was a local board. So in respect of the amalgamation of hibiscus and bays with Upper Harbour, I don't know what you'd call that so-called local board, but do you think the person in Waiwira has got much of an affinity to do with the person in Army Bay, then down to Campbell's Bay, and then out to pretty much the northwestern motorway at West Harbour? I mean, just where's the community of interest to cross that area? Where's the local? Because I don't understand it. So that's, that's one question I've got. I think it's a very difficult thing to sell. Right, the chair. Yeah, um, that's, I think, why we want to go out to the public councillor so that people okay. can tell us. And they might tell us they don't like it one little bit. Sure. The other question I've got, and, and these are a number of evaluative criteria for me, if, if we're interested in civic engagement, we're interested in participation, and that involves voting, involves a number of things, how are you going to get more petition more participation, more voting and the like, if the identity that the person has with this amorphous area scarcely exists. I don't comprehend that. So I would expect if you engage somebody that knew about um, consumer behaviour marketing and the like, they would tell you it ain't going to work. The other issue that I've got goes to unintended consequences. So the fabric of our civic society across Auckland has in large part been based around the growth of villages, the original concept that you'd have some form of civic presence, a square, library, and other aspects. Many of those things are being progressively dismembered as we speak. This process will take that even further. So where will the people go to voice their concern around an issue as it goes to the so-called local board? What happens when the local board office is gone um, and so many other things disappear? Have we given any thought to that? Through the chair, yes, we have. I appreciate your concerns. I'm okay. very concerned about voter turnout, as you are. OK. Um, the other can thing... I, can I finish? Sure. So, sorry. sorry. Already there are people travelling long distances and people feel their community could be broken down into a smaller area. That's what subdivisions are for. Um, so we're trying to keep the local by having more councillors, uh, more, sorry, local board members on those local boards. I share your concerns. I have thought about it, the team have thought about it. It's one of those things you must balance. I think the reason why we would like you to go out and consult is because 14 years on, we simply don't know what Aucklanders think of 21 local boards. But in fact, when we have surveyed them, they don't know a lot. Um, the other concern I've got just goes to um, efficiency and effectiveness. If we say that, let's say we... <laughs> assume that a local board is a form of a business and it does various things, it employs people, it's got outcomes around parks and community facilities and, and the like. I would expect, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a direct correlation between the oversight role of that local board across its assets and the efficiency of the spend. So that if you have less oversight, you're not going to have such efficiency of spend. And I'm sure Councillor Turner would have a, a number of examples he would point up. And it would be very useful to actually have some case studies presented to us around uh, local boards. And the reason I ask that is my observation is that there are local boards that have really got their act together. They've got a, a finger on what's happening in their community, um, what needs to be improved and, um, and, and, and the like, because they see it happening. You know, they see the grass being cut, they see the performance of the library and, and this and that. 
<laughs> where is the evaluation around that? Because isn't that where the real numbers are? That is making savings across projects and the like, as it goes to the CCOs, um, Auckland Transport and Watercare and all the, all the others? And isn't there a need right now with all of the things that are happening, uh, flooding and a whole lot of things, for, if anything, better oversight than what we have now? Councillor, that's actually what the analysis shows. We are, we are saying that there is the opportunity to have better oversight through economies of scale and having bigger areas from which to make opportunity to, to I'll start again. More, more scope for opportunities for what we know must happen with assets and deciding across a bigger and larger geographical scale about which of those assets are really needed, which of them could be used for other things, how that money could be used. I think the oversight goes to the issue I was saying with respect to staff and how local boards, yes, operate well, but they have also said they do not feel supported in their advice and the timeliness of their advice. They can give us examples of that. This fewer, with some savings, ploughed back into more timely, better advice, seeks to address those concerns. What I don't follow, and you might shed some light on it, is if you've trimmed down the number of representatives, that's what you're looking at. If, if you're trimming down the number of um, officers, effectively, because you're making savings, you're making how many millions of dollars is it in savings? Uh, I mean, there's quite a bit. What follows from that is that there's going to be less going on. There's going to be less oversight, surely. I, I, I cannot comprehend it any other way. Through the chair, we're not looking at staff savings. That's what I'm saying. It's not staff costs that we benefit from here. Those, the costs are set out in the value for money report. I can yeah. get to the team to come and I talk see them to you here. about that. Yeah. I see the the um, the report, and you know what is it, six odd million to nine odd um, odd million, and that involves a number of um, a number of savings. Um, I thought that there were direct staff cost savings. Indirect savings, indirect. So no no direct staff cost savings. So the one point seven three million. That's not a direct staff staff saving. Do you like me to get the team to come and speak to the report? Yeah, I, I don't understand it um, very well, and it'd be really good to have a breakdown of it. Because it'd be really good if the public could have a say. You don't understand it as well. Um, so, um, so my overall concern is that I've had an experience recently where we've gone out with information. The information has been false. The supporting information has been false. There have been agendas that have been so biased and then um, media campaigns around those things, that I, I have very little confidence, actually, in this organisation and what it goes out with, the scope, the information that supports that, and the biased nature of how sometimes we ask questions. Point of order. So that's a concern I've got, Mr Point of order. Mayor. I'm just responding to your comment. This is supposed to be questions of the staff. You've written a great big rant about the fact you've got no confidence in anything at the council. That's the one you don't resign. Um, can I Fine. go on to the next person, Councillor Butt? I know you stopped it, Mayor, but just point of order around disrespect and language. We can disagree with staff without saying right. that they are biased and essentially saying that, you know, I, I think that if Councillor Walker could... Um, Apologise for asking comments. questions, please. I was, I was referring to a particular process about which I can substantiate any number of matters of fact if I, if to I support might. my view. If, if I might. Look, the, um, I'm just going to take that with a grain of salt. But um, the, the key thing here is that the consultation material is coming back to you to sign off. You are in control of what, the, what is communicated about this to the community. Oh, thank you. Um, my concern, thank you for the report and the work that went into this and the, and the 
working party. Um, that's my issue up there. Um, how, how could we do any public consultation when you've got two very different communities, one that engages and the other one that does, you know, very, struggles to engage in, in this kind of um, consultation, this kind of topic? And then my other question was around the communities that relate to each other. Orake's got 3% bus fika. Some parts of Tamaki, it's 40% bus fika. Some parts of Tamaki, the average income is 19,000. The average income over in Orake is 130,000. Um, 56% state housing in the Tamaki area. I don't know how many in Orake, but I don't think it's that much. So I'm... Um, I don't, I don't want to support B because then that gives this life out there. Um, those are my questions, please. Thank you. That's a question. Through the Chair, you're right, Orake, Maungake, Kitamaki don't sit well together, um, which is why we prefer option B. <coughs> the the um, consultation that we've planned, we're really trying to target people we don't normally get. So going out and meeting with community groups, using community partners. That's how we plan to engage with those communities so that we can get as even a spread as we can. We'll bring that consultation back to you in good faith and you can make of it what you will. I'll try Councillor Leone. Well, mine's, mine's just really um, just around the process stuff, and I know that I raised this in the Joint Governance Working Group, but um, given that Hokura haven't been involved in this part of the discussion, what's the normal process there? Because, I mean, obviously in the Joint Governance Working Group, they're a member. Um, so have we missed that, or has there been... Has there been some discussion with Hokura? On the 13th, it was a check. No, there hasn't, but as you've pointed out, they are a member of uh, the Joint Governance Working Party. Uh, we can invite them to the Governing Body Workshop. Um, this is the first time you've seen this. Um, it will be the first time that they will have seen it. Um, or if you wanted to ask the Joint Governance Working Party to work on the 13 model further, they would be participating in that. Thank you. And just coming back to the um, the process again, um, so, I mean, normally would this have to go through the Joint Governance Working Group then come to governing body? I mean, what's, what's happened in this situation? Through the Chair... One of the reasons why staff feel the need to put this up in addition to the Joint Governance Working Party, as I said, was because we felt that this 13 model still has merit. I also was aware that there would possibly be an amendment today that would bring 13 to the table. I wanted to front foot that, if I could, um, so that you could have a look at the model, so that we could discuss it with maps in front of us. It's very hard to do that if we don't have maps. So I was operating on the best information that I had, the reason why I brought this to the table today. OK, so, yeah, there's been no... no um, none of this has been shared with any of the local boards at all, unless, aside Correct. from the ones that are here today. Correct, but they will have an opportunity, if you decide to go out and consult, to participate in that, and they will get the feedback from the public ahead of making their decisions. OK, I mean, I, I do just feel uneasy about that, given the fact that we have got a specific working group um, with the local boards as members <coughs> on it, but that's, that's my view. Kia ora. Councillor Philippina, please. Kia ora, Chair. Uh, te nā koutou, um, to our staff, and um, sorry I can't be there. Um, just a message, Rose, my first question is, you mentioned the surveys that uh, get sent out and your response was that uh, uh, that the surveys indicate that our community do not know what, what Auckland Council is about. But, Kath, um, those surveys, how many people are sent the survey and 
can you tell me the geographical spread for those surveys? Just going to check with Libby. I'm pretty sure it's the People's Panel Survey. Yes, and how many were there? Um, I'd need to. I think it was around 2,000. Um, we can check with Carol. In fact, Carol might be online and, and, and able to answer us. But they're from the reason why we use the People's Panel is because they're deliberately um, representative of Auckland's diversity. Those are the, that's the panel that has told us that they don't understand what it is that council does. They don't understand what local boards do. Don't, and, and they had, I think it was slightly more than positive um, views on, they, they, actually no, they were mixed views. Some thought yes, some thought no, or they had reasons for and against. So they saw the benefits and the disbenefits, that group of people. Okay, would, would you be surprised, my next question is, would you be surprised that um, with the Manuka Ward local boards, that um, the community out there know what they end up doing and also the structure? I do appreciate that there are some areas that know more than others, and I've seen the... Um, I've seen the concerns that have been voiced in the press from those communities, which to me seem to be largely centred on a loss of representation, which is specifically why in this model we're suggesting to you that you don't cut the number of members, that you try to the greatest extent possible retain the greatest number of members that you can on those amalgamated boards. I'm not hiding from the fact that there will still be a small loss there would be a loss of two, but we would be able to represent those more amalgamated areas still with local board subdivisions and a greater number of local board members. So I understand the concerns, and yes, I agree with you, there is definitely a greater understanding in some boards and some areas than others. What I'm asking for you to do is um, consult with everybody. Okay, Rose, um, Chair, I've got two more questions. So, Rose, can you just uh, outline very quickly, if you can, um, how many local board members will uh, will go, for want of a better term, under the 15 and 13 models, um, and which boards would be affected? I can, um, so any board that is amalgamated that has currently seven, so I think there were a couple of models that we looked at so not models, but a couple within the 15 local board model. We looked at some that we were amalgamating seven and seven to make a total would have been 14, so 14, representation, 14 representatives now. The maximum number there could be in that amalgamated board would be 12, so a loss of two. There were some boards that were seven and five, and some that were seven and six. So there would still, if an amalgamated board the maximum number would be 12. But if you're looking across the whole of the, um, of the whole of Tāmaki Makaurau, in a 15 local board model, there would be a loss from 149 down to 137. And in a 13 local board model, there would be a loss of only two further local board members. Okay, so total 12 and 14, I think. Um, would, would be lost under the two models. Yes. Yeah, I think that's what it is. My last, my last part, Hi, Rose, is can you uh, put, on the, uh, put up the recommendations from the Joint Political Working Group, please? Can you, um, can you confirm that with A, and it's got note that the governing body must consult with the public on the review of representation arrangements for the 2025 local elections. Um, that word must, um, that would include um, the status quo only. Eh? For example, if there's numbers that we don't go out uh, at all and we stay with status quo, if that is the will of the meeting, is that um, do we need to then go out um, with that uh, particular vote to consult on them? Through the chair, yes, you do, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this in the next report. So we must consult on the representation review, which is the wards, but of course, it also includes local board subdivisions. So if you stick with 21 local boards, if that's today's decision, 
and you decide not to consult. We still have some um, small boundary changes. We want to have some changes to Howick Local Board and Rodney Local Board that have been proposed, so we would still need to go out and consult, and with all Aucklanders. But if, if I might, Rose, um, to help clarify further, that would not be a reorganisation proposal. That would be a consultation with more limited scope about the representation arrangements, correct? Yes, that's correct. It could only include the representation matters. So that's number of wards, whether elected at large or, or um, by wards, local board subdivisions and local board names. I think that's everything. Yes, that's everything. So that is the limit of that scope. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. And, and if the decision is not to go out for consultation, or therefore then exactly what you said, that's what we'll be consulting on. Thank you, Councillor. Well done. Councillor Lee, please. Um, uh, thank you. I, I, I find this quite depressing, really, uh, in the continuing assumption that, that uh, uh, less is more and bigger is better, which clearly is not. And if you doubt it, just look at the history of this organisation. Um, I think it's important, though I am reassured to a certain degree that we're going out to the public, but then again, I remember when the Waitamataru and Golf Ward was reorganised in 2018, we went out to the public, and 88% of the public responded individually um, in written submissions opposed but um, the council just ignored that. But anyway, um, I, I want to be reassured that when we go out to the public, we give them proper information. Talking about the 11 local boards um, proposed by the Royal Commission is not factual at all. And I think it's important if we're going to talk to the public that we do our research and get our facts right. The Royal Commission um, model was quite a bit different to the organisation we are now in. Um, the, there was a, an Auckland Council, which was a regional body, and there were five community councils, that is proper councils, like the rest of New Zealand, and I think those community councils were, even had names, I think the Hunua, um, Rodney, Wadamata in the Western sense of that word, traditional sense, um, Manuko, Waitakere, um, Hunua. Uh, those were the community, so those were the local councils. And then there were community boards, which is the nearest analogue uh, to local boards, and probably community boards were a bit more influential. But anyway, leave, leave that, it's arguable. Um, and the three, there were three community boards only, one for Great Barrier Island, one for Waiheke Island, and one for the central city waterfront. That was the model. So if we're going out to the public and talking about 11 local boards as per the Royal Commission, that's not right. So we need to get our facts straight if we're going to consult. Um, I'll make that point. Are, are we clear about the Royal Commission, please? Yes, thank you, Councillor. So you're quite right, too, that they uh, were differently proposed. They were local councils. There were six of them proposed. Um, there, were, uh, there was consideration given to community boards. We're not proposing six. I had no intention of talking about the Royal Commission model in the consultation material. OK, because just, in the report you're talking about the model proposed by the Royal Commission, 11 local boards, which is just not true. Thank you. Sorry, what I was trying to point out is that they considered three models, 20, 11 and 6, and landed on 6. All right, well, I don't think we're going to be asking the people about that. We're going to ask them about what we're going to ask them about. Councillor Flip. Well, thank you, Worship. And as you know, I wasn't on the Working Party, so you'll forgive me if my questions... Um, may have already been answered. But my understanding of this, and it's been confirmed by the officers 
I think, uh, and that we are not required by statute to do this. But the next item, we are. It's a must. This is an optional. Um, I was one of those in the period that I chaired the Parks Committee that became incredibly frustrated around the desire by all local boards to have new swimming pools and all local boards to have new hockey turfs and all local boards to have everything and that we needed to find a structure um, that could help us cluster together because it wasn't going to be physically possible to deliver all of the wants and needs of all of the local boards. So I, I came to this with a really, really open mind, but I've got to say that having listened today to the, um, the, the situation, and I'm with Councillor Simpson on this, and it, it is very, very complicated, and we run a very real risk that we're going to confuse the public. So my question to you specifically, Rose, is, do you believe that there is consultation fatigue? And don't use the LTP as your example, because I believe that by the inclusion of the ports of Auckland and the lease and the share, shareholding in the airport created a slightly different situation, a different context. But in terms of general consultation, do you think there is consultation fatigue? <laughs> Yes, I probably do, Councillor. Um, however, we have this opportunity. Um, there will be a little bit of a gap, so it'll be July, August when we go out. It's not right away. Um, but I have to do it then so that I can, where you can actually, so that you can make a decision by September. That is the latest we can do it in order to meet the legislative time frame. What we're trying to do is, many of you have actually asked us if we, you know, I've been in other meetings where you know, there has been sort of some concern that we're 14 years down the track and we've never had a look at this. Um, what staff have tried to do really hard here is give you an opportunity at, an, at a time when you must consult on represent, representation matters to also consult on the 21 local board model, which was not something Aucklanders were expecting through the Royal Commission model. It was, in fact, a subsequent decision of government. Do you believe, um, and I personally think it's a bit of a pity we didn't hear from the local boards today because I know, speaking on behalf of Pukitaupapa and Albert Eden, they are very upset that they were not able to present. And they really believe that the communities of interest have not been sufficiently given waiting to. I appreciate that, Council. I've tried my best to um, keep faith and include for you so that you can see for yourself what people, what the local boards think. I would just ask you to consider, though, that is, there is an opportunity to hear what the public think. I think that would be a good thing to hear what our communities think of those arrangements. But that's, that's your decision. Do you think that you have given sufficient weighting um, to the thing that prompted me to take an interest in this, and that is on the provision of sports facilities for Auckland and general open space. Yes, and I rather liked what you said about having an opportunity to look more broadly at a sub-regional level about the things you don't need 21 of. Um, planning at a sub-regional level, which some of these boards, you know, they'd still be local, they wouldn't quite be sub-regional, but they're able to look across a broader range of sports fields, parks, community facilities, et cetera, to make good decisions um, with a broader scope of opportunities. Um, having worked as a, as a network planner for Ministry of Education, um, it's quite good to look at the local, but also quite good to look sub-regionally and then again at the whole, to, to see what you've actually got in those areas. We did receive feedback from staff in some of those network planning areas that they saw real opportunities in this to do better with the assets that we have. The other thing that the uh, local boards conveyed to me is their concern if you were to go with the reduced local board option, that it would put an impetus on those local board members to be full-time, and that may be a disincentive to getting wider participation from the community. Can you speak to that, please? 
I can, and I have been speaking with the remuneration authority on this matter, though I would, I don't think you're asking me this question, but, but I'll just say it. We, we can't, one of the considerations is not that we might make savings from the remuneration by having fewer. And I, I don't that, think that's that what you're saying. That is not what I'm asking. Yeah. But, but is there an opportunity to make these um, more part-time potentially? The, remun the remuneration authority has given us an undertaking that they're taking a full review of Auckland Council's remuneration arrangements as part of, the, as part of their work. I, I guess the question was more that was posed to me from the local boards that there, if you are looking for wider representation, there will be pe pe people who can continue to work in their day jobs and give back to their community. But in this model, the, that may not have been, again, given sufficient weighting to. We couldn't, we thought about it, but we couldn't give it any weighting. So um, there are real mixed views around this. Some people really value the ability for part-time people to, to participate because they bring other skills, they're business people, etc. Others thought it was really important that if we were scaling up um, the opportunities for local board that there were more full-time members. What we have been thinking about is whether there could be, you know, and, and I don't have an answer to this, but certainly there's the remuneration authority are looking at the job of representing Auckland and governing Auckland and will consider whether there is with whichever model you decide on, um, a need for different remuneration arrangements. There could be a need, for instance, to have two deputy chairs. As you know, the chairs are funded um, at a different rate than the deputies, than members. So there might be more opportunity with 12 members to break that up a little bit differently to spread the workload around. I'm sorry to monopolise things, but my, my final question is this. Given that I came to this very enthusiastically, about wanting to see a reduction in the number of local boards, having heard, read the paper and heard the discussion today and then tried to imagine how that would be translated to the public, I'm now feeling quite antagonistic towards it, given that we don't have to do this. If we don't do it now, we do have to do the next agenda item. When would the next opportunity be after this year and consultation, when would the next opportunity be, given the complexity of the task? Through the Chair, you could do this at any time you like, but you will incur the additional costs of that and you won't be reaping the rewards. Um, but if you wanted to do it in the most cost-effective way, you would do this again in six years. But it could be done before six years, but there would be additional cost. Yes. Do you feel satisfied that we have all the information? I feel satisfied that at this point you have the information and a good reason to go out to the public. I've also said I believe that we can make this simple enough for the public to understand. Um, and that's probably as good as I can give you, Councillor, and you will get the opportunity, if you so wish, to workshop this material with us so that you've got the ability to make changes. And again, on the 27th of June, you could just say, actually, I don't like any of it, and I don't want to consult. So, so I, I felt a little bit concerned today that there's obviously been work put into what this consultation material might look like. I would have liked to have seen that before we make a decision on this today. Um, yes, I can understand that you might be concerned. The reason why staff have started on it already is because a month is quite a tight time frame and we really wanted to make a go on doing those explainer bits. So whatever model you choose, if you go out with 15, we still have to explain what local boards and governing body do. It's those bits that we've been working on. I haven't been beavering away on 13 because, as you can see, it's not as well worked up as the others. So we've been working on the broadest concepts, what would the taglines be, etc. We needed to be ready to go. Thank you. Please, two more. Fully second crack and ferry to sum up. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, thank you. I think a lot of questions were asked by others, um, and I appreciate the comprehensive questions that came from Councillor Fletcher as well. Um, my one and only last question is, 
um, because you've repeated that the local boards don't feel supported in their timely advice, that they're dissatisfied with the quality advice that they've been getting, etc. So how many of the local boards that said that they were dissatisfied with the quality of the advice and support they were getting explicitly or expressly said that they felt the remedy to that, the remedy to that problem was having fewer local boards and having larger potential mega local boards. How many local boards gave you that direct, made that direct link between that problem and that remedy? Kia ora. Through the chair, thank you for the question. I haven't done that analysis, but if you follow my reasoning, it's, it's highly likely that they didn't, that there weren't many, because there were only three who actually liked the idea of change. Kia ora, thank you. Turkey's and Christmas, Councillor Ferry. Uh, thank you. Um, so my questions, um, in the past we've had a breakdown of the subdivisions um, that would appear in the 15. Do you have a slide on that? Because I think that would be helpful for people to understand that subdivisions aspect. And um, <sighs> we are... I'm really sorry. Okay. I took it out, but I can explain, if you can imagine. Two boards of seven and seven um, would amalgamate so that's 14 members over that area. The total number they could have would be 12. So there's a loss of two. They can't have any more than 12. Can't have any less than five. Um, there were some, I think there were seven and six, so there would be a loss of one. The greatest loss for any one local area was two. But we have the ability to spread that 12 around, and we must evenly so that each of those 12, however we subdivide them, you might have them in three subdivisions, you might have them in four, the numbers must equal, so the representation within each local area must remain even within that amalgamated area. So uh, to give the example of Albert Eden Pukitapapa, the subdivisions are currently, Albert Eden is divided into Mangfo and Oairaka, which have four each. And then that only leaves space for four more members from Pukitapapa, which currently has six. So the two lost members are proposed to be from one local board area. Is that correct? You can change the subdivisions. If we're going out to consultation on the 15 model, what ability do we have? Isn't that going to be part of the model that we're consulting on? I might just get for it to chip in here, we must, if we're going out on an amalgamated model, we must make the subdivisions within that bat board area even. At the end of the whole process, uh, we need to demonstrate to the Local Government Commission that there's community support yeah. for the reorganisation plan that we present to them. So we really do need to go out to the public with a reorganisation plan which shows the different local boards, shows what their subdivision arrangements are, the representation arrangements, the whole bang lot. So we do need to go out with something that, at the moment I understand, shows four, four and four for the Albert Eden Pukitapapa Super Board, um, which would mean a loss of two elected members from one local board and a loss of no elected members from the other local board that would be amalgamated. Is that correct? Uh, the concept is that you retain the representation in each of the original local boards by creating subdivisions in the amalgamated local boards. How many members in each subdivision depends on where you draw the boundaries between the subdivisions. If you draw the boundaries exactly to represent the original areas, which is, I think is what you're getting at, then you can run into problems, like you were saying, because uh, the original populations um, are, are not even. Okay. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that's, that's what we would put out for that ward anyway. Um, so with the consultation material, um, the, so what impact will local boards be able to have on the consultation material before it comes to us on the 27th of June?
I wasn't intending to go back out to local wards with the consultation material. I, I cannot, I do not have time nor staff resources. I mm -hmm. just want to be really honest about that. So if you want to make, so I've already had feedback, already feedback has been given. There was never any intention for local wards to have sign off on consultation material. That would be highly irregular and not what you've done with the LTP. <laughs> But you, if you don't, if you wish to, you can have, as I've said, a governing body workshop, and or you, if you want to take this back to joint governance working party, you could, where there are local board members. Okay, so um, this has been a, a topic of some discussion at the joint governance working party about how much input the working party would have into the consultation material, and my recollection is that the discussions were that we wouldn't be able to do, there wasn't time for that, is that correct? We are really stretched for resources on this and it is very detailed work. Yeah. Our intention was to bring it to governing body. If you want a workshop, I'm very happy to accommodate that. But it starts to impinge on the amount of time we have to actually make this simple. Okay. Um, on the um, time frames then, so we would in theory have a governing body workshop sometime prior to the 27th of June. I'm assuming that probably needs to be at least 10 days prior to get agenda report sign-off, is that correct? I'm thinking somewhere in the middle of that one month period so that we've got time to prepare for the workshop and then you've got time to consider the material. Yes. Okay, and then um, what date would the public consultation start on? 8th of July. 8th of July, so we would make a decision on the 27th of June on the consultation material. Yes. For it to go out on the 8th of July? Yes. What ability do we have in a meaningful sense to change that consultation material that comes to us on the 27th of June? Because that always works, Tesley. Um, we're just trying to think through that the purpose of the workshop that we've just agreed to undertake with you would be to I out on any of those last meetings, so I'm not really sure. Do you want another meeting after that, after you've signed it off? No, I'm trying to understand. We've got some really difficult statutory timeframes to meet, which are not, you know, not of your making at all. <laughs> um, and I'm just trying to ascertain if this is actually a practical way forward. If we can, if we do end up in a situation of having a workshop, and then, you know, can we actually meaningfully make changes at that 27th June? Meeting. I guess you could always do the bulk of it there, and if you've got some sticky issues, um, delegate it to the Joint Governance Working Party to make any final changes. But we really would have to limit those to very small things because we've got to get out to the studio, get everything printed, all the, you know, there's yeah. a lot to do in that period. So I just, uh, yeah, I'm getting a bit, um, I do need to preserve some time for the staff to actually get the material prepared because once you make the decision on the 27th, We've got 14 days to notify, which is a very tight window, given everything that needs to be printed and put together. Yeah, and that, that is one of my concerns um, with the timeframes around this. So would it be possible, with the representation review work, which I know is the next item, um, but we are doing that consultation process anyway, would it be possible to put in with that consultation some higher level local board reorganisation type questions rather than having to go for it's 15 or 21 and models with the level of detail we have now? Would it be possible to do that and then come back later with an actual proposal um, with, with a detailed model or more than one model for um, public consultation? So do it in two bites. Are you talking about doing some of it for 2025 and some of it for 2028? Potentially. Well, what, what would that be the implication? That we, we would be looking for a 2028 implementation if we were to do it in two bytes? <coughs> um, depending on what those two bytes were and how quickly we could get, you know, how small they were, how easy they were to resolve, um, you might need to take some of it to 2028. If, if, if there were really large things that you wanted to change, um, I would do my very best to get it done by 2025, but I, it depends on what it is. So if we were to ask some questions along the lines of, um, uh, you know, do people feel that the local board structure as it stands lines up with communities of interest, you know, stuff that doesn't draw lines on a map, 
if we were to ask that in July, we would not be able to do a reorganisation process for 2025, would we? We would have to wait for 2028 in terms of the timeframes. We had intended in the consultation material to do some very high level explainers, as, we, as you do, um, as we've always done, to explain in as simple terms as we can about things like communities of interest and how people feel connected to each other or don't. So there's, so there's the opportunity to set the conversation up well through the precursor material. Mm -hmm. The questions we ask, um, they do start off at kind of a high level, like if, if you like the analogy of a funnel, they start off with, you know, do you think there should, is it, do you think there should be change? Is that what we were thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do they think there should be change? And then, if so, you know, what change? And if you like this, then this or this. More that style of um, questioning rather than kind of hitting people between the eyes with do you like this model and do you like that model? It takes them through a little bit of a journey. So that at any point they can stop. At any point they can say why. In fact, we are asking people why. You know, if you've said this, then why? Um, so that we have the ability to bring back kind of insights for you as well as data, um, and and if they don't like, if they don't want to answer all the questions, they don't have to. So that's as much as I can tell you about where we're at now. So depending on what you were thinking of, uh, I don't know whether we can accom we can accommodate that sort of questioning absolutely within the timeline. So but if you were, it, yeah. sorry, if you were to start really wanting to unpick. I wasn't intending that we should go out with two 13 local board models. I had hoped that you might be able to decide on one if you were going to decide on any. I wouldn't like to get into too much detail because it does then start to run the risk that we are confusing people. Yep. And I, I think there might be a little bit of confusion around the table at the moment too. So, um, yeah, appreciate that. Um, so can I just, just put this together, hopefully tidily, and just confirm that I've got this right? So, oh, um, so when, so the rest of the process, right? So this, so we would get the um, consultation feedback on fifteen or twenty-one, um, and we would consider that and make a decision on. I think it was the something of September, is that correct? And then that goes to the local government commission. And when would we have an answer from the local government commission I'm on what the model will be? I'm fairly sure the latest date they can make that decision is 11th of April, ahead of the election. Okay, and then that has to be implemented for the 2025 general election, uh, not general, local, local election. election. Yes. That's indeed. a 2026, the In, general. Indeed, 2025 local election on the 11th of October. Okay, and, oh, sorry, Libby, I think you wanted yeah. to chime I might in. just add to that. Um, the, through our discussions with the Local Government Commission, the plan is to have the local board reorganisation decision um, before the, the decisions on the um, representation review. So um, potentially, and hopefully, we would have a decision on any local board reorganisation plan by January, and then those decisions would then influence the decisions in the um, representation review determination, if that's helpful at all. Okay, and when does, when does planning usually start for the elections? I've started it already. Yeah. Okay. And we would have to implement that model in time for the elections? Yes, and we can. I've been talking with um, our electoral officer and our deputy electoral officer, um, and we can meet those time frames. Okay. So, we, and I guess I just want to want to signal to people here, I'm potentially thinking about a foreshadowed amendment if the, if the what's on the Chairs Rex fails. Um, we could go out with the representation review consultation on the questions short of 15 versus 21 and or 13. We could do that, okay? But that would mean that it wouldn't take effect until, we couldn't take effect until 2028. That's correct? That's correct. Thank you. That would be the earliest you could do it and it would incur the costs of additional research and additional consultation. But it would also potentially have the benefit of more community understanding and yes, buy-in. It, yes, it would. Yes, it would. Oh, that one's horses have been flogged to death. Um, I think that's the end of the question, so you should escape while you can. Um, there is.
now people will probably want to theory go to debate, although the point is that we were wanting to actually ask the public